Oxford's Christchurch College would have looked at its most beautiful on July the 4th, 1862. The weather was sunny and warm, typical of what was proving to be an outstanding summer. The Isis, Oxford's name for this stretch of the River Thames, would have been sparkling in the afternoon heat as two men, accompanied by three small girls, made their way from the college down over its Christchurch meadows. Walking along the riverside path to Salter's Boatyard near Folly Bridge, they would hire a rowing skiff that would transport them on yet another of that year's river outings. Charles Lutwidge Dodson and his friend the Reverend Robinson Duckworth had several times already taken the Dean of Christ Church's three young daughters on similar excursions that usually involved a picnic in the shade of some convenient haystack at Newnham Park, five miles downstream. But today the friends, for Dodson and the children were close friends in spite of their difference in ages, would journey upstream to just beyond the village of Godstow. Although it meant rowing against the current, both men were accomplished oarsmen, able to keep a steady rhythm and choose the coolest leaf-canopied way. At the day's end, during the slowly drifting return, their child companions might steer or even paddle the craft, as was customary when journeying downriver on these happy occasions. Dodson would record such moments in verse. A boat beneath a sunny sky, lingering onward dreamily in an evening of July. And again, all in the golden afternoon, full leisurely we glide, for both our oars with little skill by little arms applied, while little hands make vain pretense our wanderings to guide. Years later in life, Lorena, Alice and Edith Liddell would recall the picnic basket packed with cakes, together with a tea kettle essential for such afternoon outings, or filled with chicken, salads and other treats for their longer expeditions to Newnham. Sometimes, said Alice, we spent the afternoon wandering in the fairyland of Newnham Woods until it was time to row back to Oxford in the long summer evening. Boating was then undoubtedly a genteel activity, practiced by many of the middle and upper classes, and with Dodson rowing bow and his friend Duckworth stroke, the three children would loll in the stern, dipping their hands in the cool river as they made their way past Port Meadow to Godstow, not far from the ruined medieval convent where King Henry II's mistress, fair Rosamond Clifford, is claimed to have died. Christchurch, the most beautifully situated of all Oxford colleges, is still seen at best from the river, as it stands serene above the gently sloping college meadows. There might have been occasions when some fluttering handkerchief waved from a convenient window told that these picnic outings received full approval from the little parents. That day, as was customary, stories had to be told. For Dodson was a master of imaginative creation, and gazing at the attentive faces, he would begin weaving another of his wondrous fantasies. The slight stutter that troubled him, and perhaps prevented his taking a holy orders, would always disappear when speaking to children. But that July day would prove to be extra special and significant, although no one could have realized it at the time. Unconsciously and without apparent effort, Dodgson began creating the basis of what would become one of the best loved works of English literature. Duckworth, amazed at the flow of wondrous stories, looked back over his shoulder to query whether they'd been already prepared, only to be assured everything was totally spontaneous. On that warm summer afternoon of long ago, the man who was also Lewis Carroll 
was creating the fairy tales out of which Alice in Wonderland would appear. This pseudonym by which Dodson became better known had been created some six years earlier, possibly to retain some anonymity in other works, when he decided to translate his first two names into the Latin Carolus Ludovicus, before retranslating into English and then reversing them to create Lewis Carroll. Charles Dodson, now better known by this pseudonym Lewis Carroll, for few recall the author by his real name, had been born on the 27th of January 1832 in Daresbury Parsonage, Cheshire, where his father, an Oxford double first, brilliant classicist and mathematician, was permanent curate, a position conferred by Christchurch, his former Oxford College. At Christchurch, Dodson Senior had been a student, akin to a fellow of other colleges, and also a lecturer in mathematics, but with such scholarly offices restricted to bachelors. His marriage in 1827 to first cousin Francis Jane Lutwidge caused these to be withdrawn, and in compensation the college had granted him a permanent curacy at Daresbury. It was far from being a lucrative post, Daresbury being but a subsidiary to a larger parish and any financial hardships experienced could only become greater as the family continued to increase in size. The young Charles was eldest son of an eventual eleven children, seven girls and four boys, but the Dodgsons managed to maintain both status and respectability. The rectory would later be destroyed by fire, but his site is now marked up by the National Trust owners who have commemorated Lewis Carroll with a plaque. However, the village church, a delight to all children and not a few adults, as the Shell Guide to Britain puts it, remains much as it was in Dodgson's time. One feature added later is a memorial window illustrating the younger Charles Dodson's achievements with representations of White Rabbit, Cheshire Cat and other characters of his Alice in Wonderland fables. Such creations were probably at least partly inspired by a Daresbury childhood. Educated by his father, together with a few paying pupils that were necessary to bring in some small additional income, the boy who was known to his family as Little Charlie also revealed a talent for sketching and writing. Soon he was inventing strange characters, making friends with wild creatures always taking a delight in exploring what was still a largely remote and even partly primeval English countryside, rich in mysterious nooks and crannies. His was a strictly religious upbringing amongst the family's other children, for whom his clever verses and strange characters would provide continuing fascination. Limericks were written in a style resembling that of Edward Lear, a contemporary together with such humorous instructions on moral behavior as never stew your sister. Like other middle-class children of the period, the young Dodsons were expected to entertain themselves gainfully, and their brother Charles soon displayed a talent for devising games that would keep them all occupied. Sharing home and life with seven sisters may have given him both some understanding of the feminine psyche and an appreciative enjoyment of young female company. Certainly, if Alice in Wonderland was born anywhere, it was here at Daresbury Rectory. The old post office remains, as does the Bridgewater Canal in which the Reverend Dodson employed a converted craft as a floating church in which services were held for boatmen's and workers' families. But perhaps it was Daresbury Church itself with its pagan green man and carved Templar's cross that did much to stimulate the boy's imagination. In the autumn of 1843, the Reverend Dodson received promotion and would move with his family to a living at Croft, a small town near Darlington in the North Riding of Yorkshire. His greatly improved stipend, together with that of the archdeaconship that would eventually follow, 
brought a considerable advance in family prosperity that caused any previous financial concerns to vanish. Croft straddled the River Tees, not far from the large and industrial Darlington, and in the early 18th century had been so celebrated for its healing sulphurous waters that these were bottled for sale in London. Yet the small spa town's prosperity would decline as a developing Harrogate attracted away much of its clientele, even though the smell and supposed curative properties of both waters were considered to be much the same. Yet prosperous gentry still resided in its attractive surrounding countryside, and the fact Croft remained a desirable place in which to live is revealed by its several Queen Anne and Georgian houses that provide some indication of its former prosperity and importance. Dodson Sr. officiated at the long and low-lying St. Peter's Church, a Norman foundation whose chancel's massive 17th century mill bank pew evidences the self-esteem and wealth, not only of that particular family, but others who followed. Dodson money renewed the chancel roof of a building that, for the carol enthusiasts, provides food for thought. Could the arched carving have inspired the Cheshire Cat? Or might the pagan fertility god near the door form basis for yet another Alice in Wonderland creation? A small collection of Dodson memorabilia that came to light in the family's rectory home is now on display in their church, in whose graveyard alongside both Archdeacon and Francis Dodson were to be buried. The town marks its connection with the boy who became Lewis Carroll, with its Lewis Close and Carroll Place. For Charles Dodson's Alice in Wonderland not only brought wealth to its creator, but provided many a source of income for anywhere that could claim the slightest connection. The rectory itself is also an evocative building. Inside is a passageway leading down to a cellar that may have inspired the very rabbit hole down which Alice plunged to her first underground adventures. Near the boy's bedroom is a window engraved with a mirror image that young Dodson often stared at. In the rectory garden outside, the boy constructed a wheelbarrow railway, provided with stations, halts, and even penalties for incorrect passenger behavior. For this was a period when the new steam railways were both fascinating and dramatically changing the nation. Darlington was becoming an important railway center associated with the celebrated Stockton and Darlington Line. Also from here would operate George Stevenson's Rocket, a steam locomotive whose efficiency helped change British and world transportation. Yet Darlington, although rapidly becoming a great industrial town, was then still surrounded by a largely unspoiled rural landscape. It was probably near this acacia tree, not far from the bedroom where he slept, the young Charles Dodson played with his siblings or would often be found reading, stretched on the grass beneath its spreading branches. The boy's education would continue, but now in the new national school his father had both campaigned to establish and helped finance by providing at least half of its building costs. But the boy still found time for drawing or writing stories and verse for his siblings' delectation, and he would become skilled at constructing toys that included a working marionette theatre. For much of his later life, the professional theatre and its actors would be another source of fascination. It was at Croft, Dodson Jr. began his rectory magazines, to which all his siblings were expected to contribute although it appears the boy himself produced most of their content. The Reverend Dodson had certainly become more prosperous, but it would still have been a relatively heavy financial commitment to send his son away to school. Even so, the boy's father understood, as did most other similar middle-class parents of the period, that the provision of education was a far greater gift than the bestowal of some future legacy.
So it was that in 1844, age 12, the young Charles Dodson would leave home to attend a boarding school at Richmond, Yorkshire, a grammar school even older than its 16th century Elizabethan charter. School subjects were mainly Latin and Greek, but for an additional charge, mathematics could also be provided, something of advantage to the new pupil. Continuing education, such as provided by Richmond, was then considered an essential for any boy hoping to enter some profession or seeking betterment. But notice the emphasis upon boys. With middle-class girls then intended only to marry and raise children, their education was considered to be of far less importance. Other than an ability to produce reasonable watercolour sketches, embroider a sampler or two, perhaps play the piano and sing, while generally making themselves attractive to suitors, little else was thought necessary. For boys it was quite different. Boarding at Richmond School offered the young Dodson a good education in an attractive setting. The town had developed on a rocky outcrop above the Swale, fastest flowing of all English rivers, it is claimed, just above where it is crossed by a fine bridge. Together with fellow pupils including two sons of Prime Minister Earl Grey, the boys boarded in Cloaca Maxima, otherwise Great Channel House, that was home to the school's headmaster James Tate and his family. Tate was considered a kindly and gentle teacher who did his best for the boys in his charge. The school itself stood in Richmond Church grounds, not far from the cobblestone square, that some medieval lord with a sense of humour decreed must always be repaired by town dignitaries, using pebbles they had to wheelbarrow themselves up from the river below. Sadly, what must have been a fine and free town entertainment has long ceased. Almost certainly, the young lad would have visited Richmond Castle, whose tall Norman keep is one of Britain's finest. And being the imaginative person he was, perhaps search for the cavern beneath, in which King Arthur and his knights are said to lie asleep. Legend has an underground passage leading to nearby Easby Priory, but this more probably recalls a sewer once draining castle guard robes, the places of ease whose rank odours were useful in keeping moths away from fur-lined clothes. In this ancient and haunted stronghold he may have conjured up military-style fantasies that would later appear in Alice and through the looking glass. Perhaps Scollard's Hall, built in 1080 and the UK's oldest domestic building, also played some part in stimulating his imagination. The young Dodson would certainly have known something of nearby Easby Priory. Richmond's and Mary's church choir stalls had been removed from there in 1511 and were still in use. Their medieval canopies were interesting and beautiful in themselves, but the misericords, the tip-up mercy seats that enabled weary monks to appear standing while really sitting down, must have had a special fascination. Here, beneath their seats, were the almost hidden, rarely seen carvings depicting aspects of medieval life, ranging from the secular humorous to religious, military or grotesque. These skilled carvings would have provided ample food for any boy's imagination, especially one such as Dodson, and may have inspired some of the Wonderland creations. Charles Dodson's schooling at Richmond appears to have been good and successful. In spite of his slight stammer and innate shyness, Charles appears to have held his own amongst its 120 students, dealing equally well with its standards of education and the prevailing rough-and-tumble typical of such institutions where boys were herded together. He did remarkably well at Latin and Greek, as with mathematics, religion, English literature and French. Not only would he prove intellectually superior to his fellows, but physically capable of protecting himself and others from the bullying endemic in similar schools of the day. 
The lad was proving himself a true scholar with moral values and developing the best manly traits. He was becoming well able to look his world in the face. But good as it was, Richmond's schooling had its limitations. And with a father desiring to give him every opportunity, in January 1846, at 14 years of age, the boy was sent to board at Rugby School Leicester. Charles Dodson would not particularly enjoy his time at Rugby, but had he arrived some years earlier, his experiences would have been even less pleasant. Even though the school had a good reputation for its educational standards, it seems the attitude and behaviour of its pupils left much to be desired. As with the majority of English public schools, bullying had been endemic, although in 1828 much had changed with the appointment of Dr. Thomas Arnold as headmaster. Arnold set about reforming rugby school, fulfilling his sponsor's claim that he would change the face of education in public schools throughout England. Yet his were not root and branch reforms, rather a building upon the good already existing there. The doctor, as he was always known, aimed to produce educated Christians. Some claimed muscular would have been more precise, placing emphasis upon treating the boys with confidence while imparting a strong personal sense of duty and value of knowledge. Some notion of the doctor's methods feature in the celebrated Tom Brown school days by Thomas Hughes, and also, incidentally, in George MacDonald Fraser's Flashman, the story of a less virtuous student who, according to Brown, was rugby's archetypal bully. Found intoxicated, once a common failing at rugby, it would seem, Flashman met his fate when again, according to Tom Brown, the doctor, who had long had his eye upon Flashman, arranged for his withdrawal the next morning. It was against this background that Charles Dodson arrived at rugby. Sadly for him, Dr. Arnold was no longer in charge, having left the school three years earlier in 1841, under some disfavour from Anglican ecclesiastical authorities, offended by several of his forthright religious opinions. Yet there would still be some connection between the two lives, even though doctor and pupil never met. At Rugby, the doctor's legacy of an improved educational system still prevailed, and the young student would benefit from the mathematics and modern languages Arnold had introduced, and above all from his stimulation of pupils towards thought and industry, rather than the mere regurgitation of received knowledge. Even so, the school Dr. Arnold had moulded was not entirely that represented by the Tom Brown story, being still rough in behaviour, with younger pupils subjected to the servitude of fagging, that is, acting as servants to most senior pupils, and with its discipline largely maintained by schoolboy prefects. In the main, Charles Dodson would not enjoy rugby school, where, like most other pupils, he was the victim of some bullying, especially at night when the boys were left largely unsupervised. His health also suffered, and he was affected both by whooping cough and the mumps that left him deaf in one ear, although his physical and mental character helped him overcome these and other problems. Sporting activities were an important part of school life. Rugby's cross-country runs and cricket matches were celebrated events but what extent Dodson participated is unclear. Certainly he came to detest blood sports, and equally may not have relished rugby's enthusiasm for other sporting activities. Indeed, his niece would claim that he kept away from its organised sports if at all possible. But few rugby boys could have avoided taking part in the school's football games that often involved hundreds at one time and it is possible Dodson may have played the school's particular version that originated in 1823 when William Webb Ellis, with fine disregard for the rules of football, first took the ball in his arms and ran. 
Thus rugby football was born. But rugby's educational standards were also good, and the boy prospered academically, winning prizes and, like many other of its pupils, benefiting greatly from its teaching and learning. It was here the young Dodson's love of mathematics developed to the extent that his tutor would describe him as the most promising boy he had taught at the school. Even so, Dodson would leave rugby in December 1849, possibly over parental concerns regarding various illnesses the school had experienced, cholera amongst them, perhaps reason for his continual fear of infection. Four months later, he would matriculate, that is, be tested as worthy of entrance at Christchurch College, Oxford. Since his father had been one of its senior students, the equivalent of other college's fellows, and tutor of mathematics, Charles would have needed little urging, and entered the college as an undergraduate on January the 24th, 1851. Few better choices could have been made. It was claimed that at any one time the college common room might have housed men destined to become leaders of politics, religion and society. Even so, his arrival was marked by family tragedy. Two days later, his mother, Frances Dodgson, would die suddenly, the new student having to return home hurriedly to attend her funeral in Croft Churchyard. A fear of disease dogged her son for the rest of his life, but perhaps his grief was ameliorated by the eventual return to Christchurch, one of Oxford's most beautiful places, Dominated by Christopher Wren's Tom Tower, whose gateway leads into Tom Quad, Oxford's largest, where 17th century Civil War Royalist armies had once mustered and paraded. The college had been founded by Cardinal Woolsey in 1525 as Cardinal College, but was reformed and renamed as the Royal Foundation Christ Church by King Henry VIII after having his former loyal servant charged with high treason and arrested. However, Woolsey would not be executed by the headsman's axe, but die at Leicester Abbey. Christ Church College Chapel is, in fact, the world's smallest cathedral, with its dean acting as bishop of the Oxford Diocese. The surrounding winding alleys, walkways, ancient buildings resembling a small town would become home to Charles Dodson from his arrival in 1868 until his death 30 years later. Although outwardly similar in appearance, this was not the college of today. A contemporary claimed Christchurch lay in an educational torpor and certainly little had changed from the 17th century when its statutes had been laid down by Archbishop Lord. But new men were appearing, and new political ideas emerging that would change university life. Nor was the college an oasis of academe. Apart from the long-standing town and gown friction between university and townspeople, college behaviour and discipline was not of the highest, with riotous behaviour often occurring within its walls. Even gunpowder featured in some college disturbances. On one occasion, the Dean Henry George Little would discover a ready fused bomb hanging on his door. Indeed, one serious outbreak of Oxford University violence later in the century led one observer to remark, it reminded me of Christchurch. But for a dedicated and imaginative student such as Dodson, the college proved ideal with its fairyland of spires and pinnacles. Not far from Wren's Tom Tower, and alongside its quad, stood the former college chapel that acted as Oxford's cathedral. This is a beautiful building whose Norman and Gothic features, vaulted aisles and fan-vaulted choir could only delight and inspire religious and artistic fervour in such an individual as Charles Dodson. So too would Christ Church Great Hall, where the author would frequently dine. 
It was probably during Dodson's many meals taken in this hall that some of the Alice in Wonderland fables were, albeit unwittingly, inspired. Dodson's three years of hard work as a Christchurch undergraduate paid dividends, and by December 1854 he was awarded a first-class BA in mathematics as head of his class, and the following year made Master of the House and Student, the latter equivalent to a fellow in other colleges. Eventually appointed sub-librarian and lecturer in mathematics, in May 1855, the college dean and canons awarded him a scholarship of £20 a year that raised his income to some £300 per annum, an amount that in those days bestowed a reasonable financial independence. Six years later, Dodson was ordained the Church of England deacon, but had he become married, would, like his father before him, have lost his Christchurch positions. Perhaps it was this reason above any other that persuaded him to remain a bachelor. What was a comfortable and highly respected existence improved further when, the following year, encouraged by his friend Reginald Southey, Charles Dodson bought his first camera and so became a pioneer photographer, an activity that would lead to long-term friendships with the Dean's children and others. It seems Southey was already practicing what many were calling the black art, from its lack of colour and the darkness necessary for its production. Photography was in its infancy, but fascinating all who could afford to purchase its expensive equipment. A photographic representation, admittedly in black and white, could now be produced in far less time than the days or weeks often required for a painting. Suddenly, artistic imagery was revolutionized. No longer did the artist have to painstakingly and accurately recreate every detail. In 1841, at Laycock Abbey, Wiltshire, William Henry Fox Talbot developed his color type process that first made the recording of images possible. Ten years later, Frederick Scott Archer both improved the collodion wet plate system and invented a means by which its negatives could be converted into positive images. Although slow and requiring painstaking preparation and attention to detail, wet plates produced excellent results. The early cameras were large, heavy and expensive using a process requiring relatively dangerous chemicals, portable darkrooms and sitters who could remain motionless for the long period of exposure. But the system worked, and to such a degree that soon large albums filled with photographic collections of every kind of subject matter were to be found in most gentry homes, where they entertained, educated and whiled away time, fulfilling much the same function as today's televisions. Whether because of Liddell's encouragement or natural creative urge, Charles Dodson made his first photographic experiments in April 1856 at Dean Liddell's home. His intention was to record the cathedral from the deanery garden, but it would lead to his becoming a frequent visitor and family friend. The deanery was not far from his rooms, and with Southey and himself carrying the cumbersome equipment, their arrival probably caused much the same frisson of excitement as would that of a television camera crew today. To be photographed was a privilege then open to few, and the Liddells, some of them at least, would have felt honoured at being invited to participate in something so mysterious and wonderful. Other photographers often employed wheelbarrows or handcarts to transport their kit, but according to a poem written by Dodson, his equipment seems to have been somewhat easier to manage. In a parody of Longfellow's Hiawatha, he wrote, From his shoulder Hiawatha took the camera of rosewood, made of sliding folding rosewood, neatly put it all together. In its case it lay compactly, folded into nearly nothing. Opened out, this would become an oblong of wood, brass and lens that mounted upon a folding tripod formed the magical camera. Mystical, awful was the process. 
and in Dodson's verse. And to the uninitiated observer of that period, it was most certainly. When the two men arrived to photograph Oxford Cathedral, they discovered three of the little children playing in the garden where they intended to set up their camera. Dodson met the Littles several weeks earlier while watching boat races on the nearby Isis and would eventually be invited to a gathering at their deanery home. But it was not until April when his new camera arrived that he decided to test it there, recording later in his diary of the children, we became excellent friends. We tried to group them in the forefront of the cathedral picture, but they were not patient sitters. These first photographic efforts at recording the cathedral were not really successful, nor were those including the children. Further attempts took place over following days, but although again these achieved little success, they led to many others when the children finally proved able to keep sufficiently motionless during the long exposures. Charles Dodson's photography would become a passport into the Liddell family to the extent he felt himself almost a member. The Dean appears to have had no problem with this, being himself fascinated by the black art. But Mrs. Liddell was a different matter. Seemingly an attractive and remarkable woman, Lorena Hannah Liddell was a determined character, immortalized in doggerel verse of the day. I am the Dean and this is Mrs. Liddell. She plays the first and I the second fiddle while another declared, I am the Dean of Christchurch, sir. This is my wife. Look well at her. She is the broad and I'm the high. We are the university. The latter verse was a witty play upon the contemporary Oxford movement debate, which was then dividing ecclesiastical opinion throughout the country. Led at first by Henry John Newman, who would later convert to Catholicism, and then Edward Pusey, this aimed to take the English church back to its former Anglo-Catholic traditions and theology, together with its associated ceremonial and formal piety. This was the High Church, akin to that Archbishop Lord had desired to establish in the 17th century, under which England's civil wars and execution of its king were a direct consequence. With Oxford University central too, but divided over this important matter, Dean Little of Christchurch, a college where all things traditional were valued, would naturally have been high church in opinion, as opposed to the more politicized, liberal and free broad church theology his wife is suggested as representing. In fact, this doggerel reflected a major problem then setting the Church of England against itself in a manner that still manifests itself today. Strange though it may seem, the younger Charles Dodson did not appear to share his father's somewhat high church stance, rather adopting a position encompassing what he saw as the best points of both high church and broad. There was never outright disagreement between the two, but the younger was clearly his own man. Hannah Little was a strong personality who would occasionally bridle at Dodson's making free of a home, bringing his camera and often taking photographs of family and guests without her permission. Her young children were spending much time in his company, posing frequently for his photographs, sometimes even completely naked. But clearly these activities were not regarded as anything of a problem. Mrs. Liddell's objections were more concerned with the manner in which this frequent visitor involved himself in family activities, almost when and how he wished. Indeed, on one occasion, to prove the point, she managed to get her family in their carriage and driving off for the day, just as he arrived. It is important to emphasize that photographing young children in the nude would not then have possessed the suspicious connotation it has today, although perhaps this reflects the period's innate hypocrisy and its underlying sexual frustration. At a time when ladies dared not reveal even an ankle, innumerable naked cherubs and girls featured on many paintings, while representations of nude male and female forms were commonplace in statuary. Books, 
paintings, actions and objects that modern opinion and laws would regard as legally actionable were then accepted as part of the normal nature of things. Dodson himself declared that photographing the nude child was a pure art form and, for many other of his contemporaries, this would also have been the case. It is well to consider that long into the 20th century, parents would often proudly display images of their young offspring posed naked on a photographer's rug. That is, until such innocent records became sullied by suspected association with sexual abuse and paedophilia. Bizarre though it may seem, in today's so-called libertarian age, it would be legally dangerous to reveal attitudes or display material considered quite normal but a short time ago. Thus the fact Dodson and many others photographed new children should not be used against him. The past must always be judged in its own context. Significantly, Christ Church's devout dean and wife appear to have been perfectly content for such photographs to be taken, and there is not the faintest suggestion of salacious impropriety in anything the children would later recall and record. Nothing but innocent pleasure appears in accounts of the many times the three children visited Dodson, whom they come to regard as a dear friend. They went to his room, always accompanied by their nurse, Miss Prickett, to be photographed or entertained by Dodson's stories, and it is significant that the only gossip aroused, and totally incorrect at that, was of the author deliberately using the children as a means of spending time with their governess. As Alice would later recall, being photographed was a joy to us. We looked forward to happy hours in the tutor's rooms. We used to sit on the big sofa on either side of him while he told us stories, illustrating them with drawings as he went along. He seemed to have an endless store of fantastical tales, which he made up as he told them, drawing busily on a large sheet of paper all the while. Sometimes there were new versions of old stories that grew into new tales, owing to our frequent interruptions that opened up fresh possibilities. But problems were arising, hinted at by comments later relating to the four missing volumes of Dodson's diary and pages cut from others, but by whose hand is unknown or indeed why. All appear to have referred to the author's early years as an Oxford tutor, his family later producing a document entitled Cut Pages in Diary that Amongst other information, states Mrs. Liddell had informed Dodson that gossip was circulating about his relationship, both with the governess and Lorena, the latter incidentally also being the mother's own name. Possibly this was reason why a break between author and family would ensue. Even so, life was good for this Oxford academic whose pursuits, other than personal study and tutoring, included giving magic lantern shows in the Great Hall to children of college servants. In 1857, Dodgson was admitted to the university as Master of Arts, one year later being declared senior student, and then in 1861 ordained as deacon. It was becoming a full and interesting life. Apart from all else, he taught himself Italian. A life whose days were marked by the booming great Tom Bell in its tower nearby. At nine each night, whether in his room or helping oversee its returning students, the clock's 101 sonorous strokes would have signified the college's original student number, and several hundred years later, their successors were still having to pass through its gate before the last note sounded. Lectures on subjects of interest to Dodson were attended, and he found time to write, not only in his diary, but for a variety of journals. Poems were produced for the Oxonian Advertiser, and publications such as the Comic Times, predecessor of Punch, and which, incidentally, the artist and illustrator John Tenniel had become staff cartoonist. Such writings, usually humorous and often fantastical in nature, were laying foundation for what would follow. Apart from photography, which Dodson is recognized as being an important pioneer, much leisure time was spent either boating or taking walks of anything up to 25 miles in length. 
Oxford itself, with its many ancient colleges and churches, would have proved attractive to one of his character and disposition. Walks were often undertaken with his three child friends, sometimes the nearby Binsey village where lived Governess Miss Prickett, on outings that would certainly have involved inspecting the treacle well in its St Margaret's churchyard. That name itself would have been attractive to the youngsters' imaginations, although in reality it referred to the well waters that, like treacle, were believed of healing powers in medieval times. The well's connection with the little girls is indicated by its inscriptions Elsie, a pun on Lorena Charlotte's initials, Lacey, an anagram of Alice, and Tilly, that was Edith's pet name. According to the Oxford Town Trail Guide, when a clergyman later asked Dodson his opinions on renovating the site, the reply was, leave well alone. Dodson's various friendships blossomed, but particularly with the Liddell children, with whom he had established a close rapport. All four had become genuine friends, and in 1863, when great excitement prevailed at the news of the Prince of Wales' wedding, Dodson had accompanied the trio to Broad Walk, where they each planted a tree to mark the event, naming each Alexandria, Albert and Victoria. Photography certainly fascinated Charles Dodson and absorbed time, but boating was also an important element in his life, hours being spent rowing on the Isis with companions such as Robinson Duckworth. This was an activity requiring both leisure time and money and thus in the main tended to be restricted to members of the gentry classes. Boatyards along the river constructed, stored and repaired craft of all sorts, from the fast one oarsman wager boats to larger rowing skiffs requiring at least two to row, and on to the four and eight oared racing shells. On most days, river craft of all kinds would be moving on the water. Even steam launches would have been making their appearance, the waterway furnishing a means of exercise, pleasure and relaxation for many. It was natural that Dodson would have wished to share these personal pleasures with his young little friends. That afternoon of the 4th of July, 1862, proved to be a special delight for the children. Dodson was apparently in good form, and in answer to their pleadings, once again began telling stories that, although not first seeming to possess any central theme, but rather more a series of disjointed items, soon began to flow as one. Later Dodson would recall, I sent the heroine down a rabbit hole to begin with, did not have the slightest idea what would then happen. These new stories dealt with the adventures of one Alice, obviously based upon Alice Liddell, who had become Dodson's favourite of the three children. He had produced similar imaginary tales so many times before, either while entertaining the children in his rooms or during their expeditions on the river, but those were quickly woven fantasies whose wondrous characters dissolved and vanished from memory almost as easily as they had materialised. But these latest stories were different, and although all his fantasies totally lacked the moralising found in other works for children, these seemed to possess some extra attraction and magic. Thus grew the tale of Wonderland. Thus slowly, one by one, in quaint events were hammered out, and now the tale is done. And home we steer, a merry crew, beneath the setting sun. Obviously, these stories made some special impact upon the three girls, for at the day's end, when the party returned to Oxford, Alice asked Dodson if he would please write them down for her. Even their creator must have realised his fantasies on that occasion must have possessed some different quality, for that evening, and during a train journey the following day, he would write out the main headings of what became Alice's Adventures Underground. Yet it would not be until December the 13th that same year Charles Dodson began writing the stories, completing the work under that same title by 10th of February 1863. This handwritten version, 
complete with the author's personally drawn illustrations and bound in green leather, would be presented to Alice Little, and thus saw the author believed bringing the project to an end. But it was not to be. With the young girl's delight obvious, Dodson's friends Henry Kingsley and George MacDonald became aware of the work's potential and urged the author to have it published. Yet it was not for another two years that this would happen, largely because Dodson felt his drawings were unsatisfactory and decided to employ a professional illustrator. Competent sketcher though he was, well able to make amusing illustrations for the little children, he realised that a more skilled artist was required to give justice to his fanciful concepts, one who could easily visualise and bring to life the imaginary characters his words portrayed. John Tenniel was his choice, a skilled artist and illustrator whose work had been displayed not only in the National Gallery, but chosen as a House of Lords fresco. Tenniel had also provided illustrations for several important books, in spite of the fact that a fencing accident in his youth had left him blind in one eye. Dodson knew well the artist's reputation through their Comic Times Association, and because in 1850 Tenniel had joined the staff of its successor Punch, a popular humorous magazine. The fact this renowned and highly respected artist agreed to illustrate a work of fantasy for children says much about how its quality and potential was regarded. Yet some friction occurred between the two, especially when the author suggested a model be found for Alice. Might he have been thinking of using the child herself? But Tenniel refused, stating he always drew from memory. According to the Collingwood biography, Tenniel replied that he no more needed a model than Dodson a multiplication table. Yet it seems Tenniel was somewhat slow in producing the final 42 illustrations of various shapes and sizes. And it was not until July 1865 these were completed and the whole work submitted for the first publication of 2,000 copies. With illustrations pen drawn onto boxwood blocks, then hand cut by an engraver, the fine detail could easily be blurred by poor paper or ink. And it was possibly for such reasons that the artist declared himself dissatisfied with the results. Dodson did not see any problems but with only the first 50 copies bound, agreed to cancel further production, request the return of all copies already sold, and reimburse their purchases. Even so, a few were seemingly given to institutions such as children's hospitals, while the few copies Dodson had personally inscribed as gifts of friends probably remained with them. All in all, this represented a considerable financial loss that had to be borne by the author himself. Only 23 original Alice's Adventures Underground are known to exist, and as the 1865 Alice are exceedingly valuable. Dodson then undertook what amounted to a full rewriting of his story, adding to and editing the original manuscript as he went. Even the work's title had proved a cause of personal dissatisfaction, so this was changed into Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, the name by which it is known throughout the world today. By November 1865, this new version was published using a different printing house whose results were found highly satisfactory. The second edition of 4,000 copies proving an enormous success with critics, who in the main proved most complimentary. According to Morton Cohen's biography of Dodson, there were comments such as a glorious artistic treasure, a more original fairy tale that's not lately been our fortune to read. In the event, it did not matter over much what reviewers thought. The book was already selling like hot cakes, with ever more being printed and versions produced in other languages. Edition was following edition to meet demands from a seemingly insatiable public. Charles Dodson, who was now becoming better known by his pseudonym of Lewis Carroll, decided to spend some of his new fortune on a visit to Russia, 
which in 1867 he undertook in the company of his friend Henry Lydon. But the success of Alice had put into his mind the notion of writing a sequel. And when this was mentioned to friend Lydon, it was the latter who suggested, through the looking glass and what Alice found there, as possible title. The story itself did not seem to pose too great a problem for one of such imagination, but its illustrations would. The first Alice had benefited greatly from Tenniel's fine work, but for whatever reasons the artist now refused to participate in the new venture. Whether this was due to friction that had occurred over the first edition, or because the original work had placed the illustrator very much in demand, is unclear. Another two years would pass before Taniel finally agreed to collaborate in the project, and somewhat grudgingly even then, informing Dodson it would be done only whenever he could find time. In fact, some of the weird creatures envisaged in the story would have been extremely difficult for any artist to portray, such as, for example, Dodson's ant in a wig that Taniel refused even to attempt. Therefore, it was not until December 1871 that all was ready for Macmillan, the publisher, who had been pressing for the book to be out by Christmas. Even so, problems over the illustrations remained. When Taniel's depiction of the Jabberwocky arrived, it appeared so frightening that Dodson asked a number of mothers whether they thought it would terrify their children. Almost all of the parents consulted felt this would indeed be the case with the result that the Jabberwocky illustration was placed within the book's pages, rather than on its front cover as had been intended. In the event, there were no objections either to story or illustrations when the book appeared in December, so good was the public reaction. A first edition of 9,000 sold almost immediately, as did another 6,000 all being produced in time for Christmas. One year later, over 150,000 copies of Alice in Wonderland and 100,000 of Through the Looking Glass had been sold, the sequel being in general considered the better of the two. By the time of Dodgson's death in 1898, the two books jointly had become England's most popular work for children and by his 1932 centenary was considered to be one of the world's best known of all works ever written for them. So why did these books based upon fantasy tales made up to entertain child friends achieve such astounding success? Perhaps it was the total absence of the moral teaching so typical of other Victorian works for children that were intended less to entertain than mould character. Most books of this nature always included some moral admonitions such as you must not, or do not do this, or always behave yourself, or this will be your punishment. Even though every creature featured in the story was clearly a figment of imagined fantasy, all possessed adult idiosyncrasies that children could not only associate with, but find amusing and entertaining. The little children could easily recognise the particular adult figures being caricatured, but other youngsters could also envisage adults they knew. Lorena, Alice and Edith readily understood that Alice was herself, Lorena the Lori, and Edith the Eaglet. The Dodd was clearly Dodson himself, while Duckworth was the obvious inspiration for Duck. The Red Queen was clearly based upon Miss Prickett, the children's governess they nicknamed Pricks, because she was one of the thorny kind, while Tweedledum and Tweedledee were clearly Duckworth and the author himself. Dodgson's stories also contained puns and double meanings most youngsters could relate to and understand. Humour with which they were comfortable, as were the author's nonsense world and his special use of language. Within the work's pages were fantastic characters and situations such as children might create in their own imaginations, but now brought into vivid life. 
Above all, these were tales told by an adult who understood and could relate to children, possessing no hidden messages and never any attempt to lecture. In short, the man who had become Lewis Carroll wished simply to entertain young people, not to teach or instruct, but make them think and laugh. For much of the remainder of his life, Charles Dodson continued his writing and mathematical lecturing. His earliest publications had been the serious Syllabus of Plain Algebraic Geometry, together with Plain Trigonometry and a guide to the mathematical student, but his works of fantasy would bring most fame. In 1876, he produced his epic nonsense poem, The Hunting of the Snark, that would be dedicated to the young Gertrude Chataway he had met and befriended on the beach at Eastbourne. Inspiration for some further fantastical book for children seemingly left him, and his last important work would be the two books dealing with Sylvie and Bruno that appeared in 1889 and would be described as the most interesting failures in English literature. Why this combination of novel, fantasy and ethical standards was so criticised is puzzling, for its pages reveal much of the man himself, his attitudes, opinions and beliefs. Remaining a Christchurch student, that is fellow, Dodson began taking long summer holidays at resorts such as Pevensey and Eastbourne, but the latter town would become his favourite. Sea air had for many years been considered as specific against disease, something of which Dodson had a profound fear. Now Eastbourne supposedly ozone-charged air, so good for health, and the sight of scantily clad children playing happily on its sands seemed to have proved an attractive combination. Charles Dodson had always been fascinated by the stage, possibly since he had first felt the magic of Richmond's Theatre Royal many years before. Oxford was then but an easy train journey from London, with all its delights and theatrical performances, and the lecturer soon became a frequent visitor. He made friends with politicians, attended parliamentary sessions, and eventually found a convenient hotel that provided a pied de terre, a useful base from which art galleries and museums could also be viewed. Opera was attended, but more frequently he would visit the theatres for which London was renowned, making friends with actors and actresses and others concerned with stage life. Circuses were a source of fascination, although at a time when some coarseness of language and content were considered normal, Dodson avoided music halls and always judged any performance by whether he thought it suitable for children. In his opinion, the slightest hint of anything irreligious or use of the mildest bad language ruined any theatricals. Indeed, Dodgson's character seemed to possess a strange contradiction of early 19th century more relaxed attitudes and later Victorian prudery. However, there were other stage productions that delighted and intrigued him, particularly one of 1867 featuring a number of children in a colourful Christmas setting. Perhaps it was this that convinced the author that Alice could be performed on the London stage. In fact, the work would appear in 1876 as an amateur performance, but it was not for another ten years that a professional production would be staged in the West End when it was declared a theatrical success. Considerable responsibility fell upon the writer when his father, Archdeacon Charles Dodson, died in 1868. With his siblings then about to lose their home at Croft in Yorkshire, their brother acquired for them the lease of the Chestnuts, a large and comfortable house in Guildford, Surrey. And although not residing there himself as such, his main base being Christchurch, he did spend some holiday time with his sisters, and certainly regarded it as home to the family of which he was now head. Guildford, an Anglo-Saxon settlement, is an attractive term. 
It's largely 10th century St Mary's Church replaced an earlier structure, probably of timber, and although rebuilt after an 18th century fire, retains many original features, particularly its fine tower. Charles Dodson's funeral service would be held in this building before his burial. Little remains, however, of the town's Norman castle that, like so many others, was allowed to crumble in later, more peaceful times or used as a quarry for local houses. The castle grounds became a public park in 1888. There are Alice Gardens now possessing a modern 1990 memorial showing Dodson's child inspiration making her way through the looking glass. It may have been at Guildford in 1874 when Dodson was helping nurse his godson Charlie, who was then dying of tuberculosis, that there entered his mind one line of nonsense verse, namely, For the snark is a boojum, you know. This inspiration that Dodson failed utterly thereafter to explain would spark his amazing nonsense poem, The Hunting of the Snark nor was he ever able to elucidate what the poem was really about. Possibly this bizarre inspiration came as a release that allowed him some escape from the tragedy of his godson's death. Child and even nude photography continued, but now gossip was spreading about an aging man who seemed to prefer the company of children to that of adults. And on the 15th of July, 1880, he used his camera for the last time. Whether this was simply due to the changes in techniques, Dodson was always a wet plate fanatic and would have disliked the new systems then appearing. Or whether to concentrate upon other things is unclear. But Victorian society was changing its attitudes and views with what was once considered innocent rapidly becoming a cause for suspicion. As he aged, Dodson would become something of a recluse, even though remaining a college personality of legend. Yet by 1881, he would resign as mathematics lecturer, although retaining his fellowship, seemingly with the intention of concentrating upon writing. These later works would be of surprising variety, whether on voting or mathematical puzzles woven into story form, or the reissuing of Alice's Adventures Underground, along with many other projects. Now he would express opinions well in advance of their period concerning railways and medicine, vivisection and blood sports, even questioning the prevailing Christian beliefs in eternal damnation and bodily resurrection. In the early part of 1898, Charles Lutwidge Dodson was spending some of his Christmas holiday at the Chestnuts Guildford, together with his six unmarried sisters. On the 5th of January, he appears to have contracted what seemed to be a normal bronchial cold. But this condition would worsen steadily over the next several days, until finally bringing about the writer's death on the 14th of that month. Strangely, few mourners attended Dodgson's burial in Guildford's Mount Cemetery, where he lies under an epitaph reading, Thy will be done. Reverend Charles Lutwidge Dodson, Lewis Carroll, fell asleep January the 14th, 1898, aged 65 years. Where I am, there shall also my servant be. Yet such a life, preoccupied with the delights of childhood, would have been better marked by the author's own words. More appropriate was Dodson's recalling how Alice in Wonderland was inspired. The amazing work of, like its author, has become immortal. Many a day we rode together on that quiet stream, and many a fairy tale was extemporized for their benefit. Yet none got written down, 
They lived and died like summer midges, each in its golden afternoon, until the day one little listener petitioned that the tale might be written down for her. The family's tragedy did not end at Guildford Cemetery. With their former occupant dead, Dodgson's Christchurch rooms had to be cleared quickly for another, when large bundles of the author's letters, manuscripts and personal papers were thrown hastily on the fire to be burned. The remainder of the author's effects, cameras, equipment and the rest would be auctioned for a pittance, thus scattering and destroying an archive of national significance. As Morton Coyne's biography points out, the sale brought in a total of slightly over £700, less than 5% of the amount Alice garnered from the sale of her Lewis Carroll treasures. Even so, this great writer had in later life made relevant comment on the unimportance of worldly things when he recalled long departed times of innocent joy and happiness. I'd give all wealth that years have piled, the slow result of life's decay, to be once more a little child for one bright summer day. Perhaps of all possible epitaphs, this would have been the very best. Mm -hmm.